Yeah, a lot of folks looking at the potential Republican field for 2012, as far as president's concerned, going, oh, boy. Hey, there's oven mitt. Who else is out there? Huh. I mean, John McCain's not going to run again? People are just, I mean, the, uh, at Sarah Palin? Yeah, I mean, there's some excitement about Sarah Palin, but I don't know. Somebody who may be jumping in, we're going to find out from him, from the horse's mouth. Talk show host, uh, Herman Cain from Atlanta. Herman, how are you? I'm fine, but they call me the dark horse candidate. You know that, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> what is that? Look, I told you in Washington, uh, am I going to have to break out honkies for Herman? <laughs> Yep. <laughs> so you're yep. gonna so if you're gonna they, do hey, it. Hey Phil, if yeah. they believe in free enterprise and they believe in fiscal responsibility and they believe in the constitutional liberties that our founding fathers put in there, I don't care what title you put on them. That's what Herman Cain is about. Well, that's excellent. That's what people are looking for exactly. now. You you may be able to bridge, uh, you know, the Tea Party and the Ron Paul people and everything else. But there's one thing that I have got, and people have said, well, you know, you need to ask Herman about this. Right. And that is uh, your support, or the, what they perceive as your support, uh, for the Federal Reserve. I believe you're on the board for them. And a lot of people see the Federal Reserve as the enemy. I'm, I'm, a, I'm not a big fan of the Federal Reserve either. What do, you, what do you say to folks about then? Okay, first of all, the Federal Reserve today is totally different from the Federal Reserve that I served on in the mid-1990s. The Federal Reserve today is much more politicized. They're much more politicized because the size of our national debt has gotten to skyrocket levels. And so Ben Bernanke is doing things that Alan Greenspan and that Federal Reserve never would have considered, like spending $600 billion to buy our own debt. That is ridiculous. Oh, I know it. So, and secondly, there are some people who say that the Federal Reserve ought to be audited. I don't care if they audit the Federal Reserve. I'm not against that, but I don't think that that's going to solve anything. The thing that's going to solve something, so those people that want to audit the Federal Reserve, go for it. But the people who are saying that I'm against auditing the Federal Reserve, Phil, let me just set the record straight. I'm not against that. That's just not a issue that I am going to lead the parade on in order to try to fix some of the biggest problems that we have. If they want to audit them, fine. The biggest thing that we need to do is to get serious about reducing the debt. That will help to increase the value of our currency. The other thing that we need to do is to get serious about stimulating the economy with direct stimulus, not more of this stuff that President Obama talked about in his State of the Union address. Now, and when you talk about direct stimulus, you're talking about coming from the people and not from the government. Exactly. For example, when they extended the tax rates for another two years, they should have made the tax rates permanent. When they basically said they're going to provide a two percentage point tax holiday with the payroll tax, it should have been all of it, 6.2 for the employee and 6.2 for the employer. That's what I call direct stimulus. And here's something else that they are not telling the American public. If you had done that for a year, you would have spent the same, you would have spent less than the amount of money that they spent on this $1 trillion stimulus bill that didn't stimulate anything except bigger government and more debt. That's all the stimulus package did. Yeah. Well, look, you know about this stuff. A lot of people know you, of course, primarily from your talk show. Uh, but you're a businessman, too. I mean, uh, Godfather's Pizza, right? Yes. I used to be the president and CEO of Godfather's Pizza. And when I took over Godfather's, it was looking bankruptcy right between the eyes. Guess what the United States of America is doing? We are, all, we are looking bankruptcy right between the eyes. Most politicians won't be honest with people. We are broke. That's what right. part of broke don't they understand? <laughs> but the fact of the matter is... The things that the politicians are talking about, they're not going to fix the problem. Here's what we've got to do to fix the problem, Phil. Number one, you, it can only come from the presidency. This is one of the reasons that I'm considering running for president. 535 members of Congress are never going to agree on the solution that we need to pursue in order to get this, company, this country back on the right track. It can only come from the presidency which is why I made this bold move of announcing a presidential exploratory committee. Here's how we stimulate the economy. First, 
make tax rates permanent. Businesses don't make decisions based upon a two-year extension of tax rates. That just maintains the uncertainty that businesses are faced with and the uncertainty that's hanging over this economy. Secondly, lower the top corporate tax rate from 35% to 25%. President Obama alluded to lowering the corporate tax rate in his State of the Union address, but he didn't give a specific number. John McCain proposed lowering it to 25% when he was running for president. In my opinion, that's a good start, but we need to do more. Yeah, it ought to go away, actually. It ought to go away. That's, that means the fair tax. But I think we need to work toward that rather than try to do that all in one swell swoop. Yeah. Now, here are, other, here, here are two other what I call no-brainer, low-hanging fruit ideas. One, lower the capital gains tax rate to zero. That would encourage people who take risks, spending that money to build businesses, it would encourage them to spend more of it. Like a lot of companies who have cash, but they're afraid to invest it because they don't know what the tax structure is going to be. No. The second one is repatriated profits, profits that have been generated in other countries by U.S. companies. When they come back to the United States, they have to pay double taxation. Why don't you make it zero? The fact that it's stuck in these other countries, and you're not going to get it back anyway, why don't you take the tax rate to zero? The last time this was done, Phil, was back in 2003 when George Bush was able to get Congress to lower the top corporate tax rate on repatriated profits from 35% to 5.25%, and $350 billion came back into this economy. It has been estimated that if we do that same thing again, nearly a trillion dollars could come back into this economy that could be redeployed to help create jobs in this country. Right. To me, those are no-brainers. Well, they are, but we've got, a, we've got a, a president right now and a bunch of Democrats in Congress who believe that the government is there to create jobs. And yes. the government's not there. It's, the, it's there to get out of the way so that the private sector yes. can create the jobs. Exactly. You're absolutely right. They believe that the <clears throat> answer to everything is more government and more spending. That's why we need a president in the White House who believes and understands how less government and less spending and more direct stimulus to the people and businesses is the key to turning this economy around. Well, indeed it is. Uh, the, the problem is, is getting, as you say, you know, getting all this through Congress. You're, you're, you're saying that the, you wouldn't have to do that, that, the president could do a lot of this on his own. How would that work? The way that's work is the president can propose it and then explain it to the American people, which is what I would do. And when the American people understand it, they will demand it. This is what we saw on November the 2nd. The American people understood that health care deform legislation wasn't good for America. Right. So, so what did they demand? They demanded a change of control in Congress, and it came to fruition on November the 2nd. As president, what I would do is any idea that I wanted to get passed through Congress, I would make sure that it was understandable enough that the American people could get behind it and put pressure on their elected representatives. 535 members of a committee called Congress will never put a bold, aggressive solution on the table. It has to come from the president. And with our current president, with all due respect, it's not in his DNA. Because quite frankly, I don't think he understands uh, the free market system and how it works and how it should work. With all due respect, I don't think he understands uh, basic economic principles of what I call economics one, not 101, economics one. And so as a result, the only things that he's putting on the table are based upon what his advisors are telling him. Now, you've got to ask yourself, five, four, four of his five top advisors have now left after two years when the policies didn't work. Right. But what does that say about what we can expect for the next two years? And he's going to bring in a group of new advisors. I've got to be honest with you, Phil. I'm not very optimistic about what's going to happen over the next two years, which is why we've got to focus on getting the right person in the White House who understands economics and who understands the free market system, but more importantly, 
who understands how to go about solving some of the biggest problems we have in this country. Well, you got, of course, you got the background, uh, the business background. You've got the issues right, and you've been talking about them for years on the radio. Yes. And you were in the military, in the Navy, right? No, I worked for the Navy as a ballistics mathematician. Yeah, tell me about that, because I saw that. What uh, What do you, I mean, you figure trajectory and all that kind of stuff. What do you yes. do? Yes. <laughs> now, if you fire this at this speed, it's going to hit that guy over there. That would... <laughs> That's exactly right. Uh, I worked on developing what we called ballistics for the weapons systems that were on our naval ships and on some of the naval fighter aircraft. As an example, when a fighter aircraft goes in at a target, that aircraft has a fire control system, a computer on it, that that measures wind, speed of the aircraft, movement of the aircraft, movement of the target, you know, a whole lot of other factors in order for that pilot, as you've seen in movies, to get his target right get his that little zero on the target right well that's those parameters in the computer are the parameters that i used to develop for the navy such that the computer did what it was supposed to do it's called ballistics and i developed ballistics for the navy for fighter aircraft and for the naval ships and we had to use the equations of motion because I'm a mathematics major and a physics minor. We used the equations of motion to determine those parameters. Remember back during the Gulf War when they were showing some of the highlights of how accurately they were able to hit some of the targets during the Gulf War? Green. Well, the reason that they were able to do that is because someone had developed the ballistics and the parameters that would allow them to hit those targets that accurately. So what I used to do is to figure out how to hit targets more accurately when you're shooting them from an aircraft or you're shooting them from a big ship. Right. And how long did you do that? I did it for six years. Wow. I did it for six years when I graduated from Morehouse College. And also during that time, I went back and got my master's degree in computer science. But uh, even though I have a strong technical background, one of the things that I pride myself on is being able to break it down, and communicate to people in terms that people can understand. That's the type of president we need if we are going to get some of these issues addressed uh, that we face that they keep putting off or they keep ignoring. Well, what about people like Romney and Sarah Palin and some of these that they think, well, there's a foregone conclusion. It's going to be one of them. What do you say to people who say, hey, Herman, you know, not enough people know who you are. You can't do it. <laughs> I say thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that just motivates you even I more, doesn't say it? Thank you. That encourages me even more. Look, I have the greatest amount of respect for Romney and Palin, uh, Palente, and all of the other people that might be in the Republican field. I consider that, you know, a compliment. I'm, I'm inspired by that. Here's the thing that people are going to have to look for all of these potential candidates have a different set of skills, okay? I have a different set of skills. And I believe that Amer- the American people have an appetite for someone that's a problem solver and not necessarily a politician. Mm. I'm not going to try and discount what those other potential candidates can bring to the party. I'm simply going to put on display what I can bring to the party. The biggest thing that distinguishes me from many of the other candidates is my problem-solving ability. That's what my resume shows. That's what my experience shows, problem solving. I tell audience all the time when I'm speaking to them at town hall meetings, other rallies, look, I don't claim to have all of the answers. I prefer, I claim to be able to get to the answer. This is how I was able to turn companies around, to be able to pull companies back from the brink of bankruptcy, knowing how to get to the answer, not necessarily having the answer. And with all due respect to all the other candidates, they would approach it a different way. I can't say how they would approach it, but my track record says how I approach problem solving, and you know we've got a bunch of problems in this country, and that's what distinguishes me, quite frankly, from some of the other candidates. Oh, yeah, you get in there, Herman, you'll have no shortage of problems to solve, I can tell you that. No, (laughs) no A lot lot of work to do. The other thing that I won't have a shortage of is the resistance from within inside the beltway. But you know what? I believe that I can handle that resistance because if I get the Republican nomination 
I believe that I will get elected president, to be perfectly honest with you. I think it's going to be harder to get the nomination than to beat Barack Obama. Yeah. I think Barack Obama has some vulnerabilities, some vulnerabilities that I can exploit. He does not have an understanding of economics. He does not know how businesses work. He does not know what it takes to stimulate businesses to create jobs. And secondly, I have a, a developed ability to communicate and connect with people, to get people engaged and inspired about what it is that you're trying to do. Do you remember when President Obama said that the reason that there's so much negative opposition to the health care reform legislation that he shoved down our throats? Yep. He said maybe he didn't explain it right. Well, that, that, well, that's the thing. Look, we're, we're up against it on time there, Herman. He he explained exactly right. They knew it. That's why they didn't they want it. They knew what they were getting. Well, listen, folks, you need to go to HermanCain.com, yes. C-A-I-N. It's your exploratory committee website, right, Herman? Yes, that's exactly right. Well, we appreciate it very much. And look, we're going to be launching the honkies for Herman shortly. So I love it, the, Bill. Uh, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Herman, and Thank good luck you, out there, man. Thanks a lot. Take care. All right, Bye-bye. quick time out. We're going to be back in a moment. 1-800-618-PHIL. Stay right where you are.